Well, howdy there, Internet people. It's Bo again. And today we're going to be talking about the roads to your public library because a whole bunch of you sent me uh, an image of a bunch of books in a dumpster. And there were a lot of concerns. So I have reached out to somebody who will be able to answer them for us. Okay. You want to introduce yourself and take it from there? Sure. Hey, everybody. My name is Allison Macrina. I use the pronouns she and her. I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I am a librarian and a privacy activist. And I run a small organization called Library Freedom Project. All right. Okay. So now that we have established you are somebody who will be able to answer this question, um, why are there dumpsters full of books? Well, when you have a library, uh, books get purchased. They come in, you, you process them, you catalog them, you put them in the library catalog. And then you got to put them on the shelf. But the problem is there's already books on the shelf. So you have to make some decisions every so often about which books get to stay and which have to go. And so, you know, the older books, the ones that have been like through a lot of wear and tear, the ones that maybe don't get checked out ever, those, there's a whole process of removing them from the library shelf, it's called weeding. Now, the first step is usually, you know, there's a, most libraries have like a friends of the library book sale, you know, like right when you come in the library, there's some books for sale for like a dollar, or they have maybe a bigger sale, like once a month or once a quarter or whatever. That's like a, a whole first sort of filtering system for these discarded books. The next filter is like, you know, donation, you know, totally free, maybe filling up little free libraries or whatever. And then the next filter is there's still always going to be a bunch of books that people don't need or want that are older editions that are like old textbooks that are out of date series and things like that. And they have served their purpose and now they need to go to book heaven. And unfortunately the boat to book heaven is a large dumpster. Fair enough. So these images that are floating around that people are seeing, this isn't some massive censorship effort to get rid of, you know, Huxley's books or anything. No, I mean, the thing is, librarians like books and we don't right. like we tend to strongly oppose it uh, in in almost all of its forms. And so it's not us saying that we think books are bad or that we want to hurt them or burn them or anything like that. It's simply a matter of, of space. I think something that people don't really understand about libraries is that libraries are not archives. We don't, ha we don't collect things for historical value. We wouldn't even have the space to do it if we wanted to. Archives do that, but archives for the most part have like, you know, some fairly, if not rigorous, at least standard way of deciding like what what things are uh, have a historical merit and what kind of stuff that's old should still be kept for whatever reason. And it's not really the case with libraries. We want our collections to be current. We want them to be, you know, to reflect our community's needs. And I don't know of any community that needs a bunch of musty, dusty, old damaged books. Right. And the reason that these don't get donated is because you can't really find a home for them? Yeah, exactly. I mean, when you consider the volume of books that we're talking about, I mean, even libraries with very small book budgets are getting new materials all the time. And if you go into your library, any robust, well-functioning library is going to have already pretty full shelves. Usually we try to leave like... um. It's not a standard thing, but we try to leave some space at the end of each shelf, right? We want, you know, a little bit of room to add more things, um, not too much room because we want lots and lots of books there. Um, but if you get new books, the old ones have to go. And also, you know, if you consider the way that libraries function, they we're, we're circulating these books all the time. And so people are using them. We want people to use them. We want people to enjoy them. But think about the way that people use books. You know, have you ever like 
dropped a cup of coffee on a library book or like you were reading into the bathtub and you dropped into the water or you just got it kind of nasty in some other way. Books come back to us all the time in these conditions and sometimes we just have to throw them out. A lot of them get replaced. Some of them don't. They've done, they've served their purpose. Um, so it's really just a matter of like, it's, it, there are a lot of books out there in the world. There are a lot of books getting published all the time. A lot of new materials coming in. We can only donate so many. And actually book donation is pretty laborious. Like it takes a whole team of volunteers to do all the sorting and get the book sale going and you know if you even if you just put books out for free some of them wind up in the trash anyway so it's a lot of effort to give them all a good home it's not possible with all of them all right makes sense so today with as much access as people to people have to the to the internet um how important are libraries still? Libraries are immensely important. In fact, they are more popular than they ever have been. And the, the popularity index for libraries has been, it rose pretty significantly around the time of the 2008 um, financial collapse, you know, the economic crisis, because lots of people who lost their jobs or lost different kinds of income had a greater need to use the library for all different kinds of reasons. So some of these people, because they can't afford internet at home or can't afford a computer anymore and need to use the library's computers for job searching or whatever, or they came to the library to try to learn computer skills because they had lost you know, they had been in whatever job for however many years and they, they lack essential computer skills that they didn't learn on that job, or they just lost whatever discretionary funds they would they would use to buy books. There are all kinds of reasons that people started using libraries in increasing numbers around then. And it's held pretty steady um, since. One thing that has declined significantly is the budgets of libraries, but the budgets have gone down while the interest and in, and in usership has gone up. And so, you know, even with the internet, you mentioned people doing all kinds of research and finding information that they need online. While that is certainly true, it's also true that the majority of books that are published are not easily found on the internet, at least not for free. And also um, people still like to read things in print. You know, that's something we kind of learned after ebooks became popular a number of years ago, their popularity kind of plateaued. Like there's something about books that people still really like and treasure. And libraries offer an opportunity to try out books that you maybe don't, you know, wouldn't want to purchase. You want to learn a new skill or something, or, you know, children's books because they go through them so quickly or for whatever reason. The other thing is that libraries offer a lot of other kinds of programs that are really essential in our communities. And so, you know, we offer different kinds of technology education. We offer job skills training. We do a lot of programs with immigrants and people who are English language learners. And so, you know, when you think about the library as a community space where you can seek out information if you are are looking for information, but you can also do you know, social educational activities. You can also use a computer, you can browse a magazine, or you can just be. There really isn't any other space in our society that exists in the same way. And I think given the way that public spaces have been increasingly privatized over the last 30 years or so, um, and how, you know, you can't easily even go to like, you know, certain people can't go to the like mall or whatever, because if you stay there too long, you're considered to be loitering because if you're not a consumer, you're not like spending money on things, your presence is less welcome. The library is a place where you can just go and be and it's free for everyone. And it doesn't matter if you're a citizen. It doesn't matter if you live in that community. It doesn't matter if you are homeless. You are welcome to be there. Nice. Nice. Okay. So tell us about your other project. 
Yeah, so I run this organization called Library Freedom Project, and what we are is a community of practice for library workers, so librarians and other folks who work in libraries in different capacities. We are working together as a community fighting against um, surveillance in our communities and fighting to protect and advocate for privacy. Now, you might be wondering, like, what is the relationship between libraries and privacy? Why is this a thing that librarians care about? Well, the reason is a few things. Number one, privacy is one of the core values of the library profession. So we actually have a, a code of ethics that was created in our profession many decades ago. And there are a number of different things codified in our in our ethical mandate of like, who we are and why we exist and intellectual freedom is a piece of that. Uh, but privacy is a really big piece of it because if you don't have privacy, you can't really read, write, research freely. Our free speech rights are really dependent on our privacy rights. If we feel like we're being watched, then we're gonna self-censor, we're gonna behave differently. And so libraries already have this fundamental value the other part of it is that we also have a history of fighting for privacy and protecting it. And so, you know, this goes back to the 1950s of librarians resisting, um, you know, the, the Red Scare and anti-communist inquiry into our patrons reading records um, all the way through. Um, right after September 11th, when the USA Patriot Act was passed, um, librarians were some of the only people who really uh, vocally resisted that legislation and which was really remarkable because, you know, if you if you were an adult during that time, if you remember what it was like after 9-11, it was not a period where any kind of dissent was tolerated. It was very much like you're with us or you're against us. And so librarians as a group um, really rejected that way of thinking and said, you know, this is something this this is a bill that that will really um, encroach on people's privacy rights. And so we you know, we have this long history of it. And so what is different now? And the reason that I started my project is because privacy uh, and violations of privacy and surveillance have become totally different at the end of the 21st century, both because of computing power and how cheap it and easy it is to collect and store enormous amounts of data, how lucrative that is to both uh, you know, industry to, you know, for consumer technologies and like big tech, but also because of how much uh, police have been increasing their technical ability um, and their surveillance capabilities. And so what this means for librarians is that our communities are really affected by the loss of privacy. The internet has impacted their loss of privacy and the people who use the library the most, and I'm talking about immigrants, I'm talking about poor and working class people, I'm talking about people who have been formerly incarcerated, or people who've experienced homelessness. These are all people who are much more at risk from the loss of privacy, or are much more targeted by different surveillance systems. And they're also people who are much less likely to know what to do to help themselves. And so Library Freedom Project, we're a community of library workers who are learning about these different systems together and learning about different mitigation strategies that can help our communities, both in the micro level, like helping people with better passwords, to the macro level, like advocating for bans to facial recognition and other invasive surveillance technologies. All right, and your organization has some uh, pretty, pretty high level endorsements here from from some names that you know I've heard of, there's this Snowden guy who, yeah, there's who, who Snowden have guy. tweeted about you. <laughs> yeah, you know, we've been really fortunate that um, ever since, oh, I founded LFP in about, it was like officially official in 2015, but I started working on it um, really because of Snowden. I started, you know, when the Snowden revelations came out in the summer of 2013, I was really obsessed with the story and I started thinking about the way that it related to my work as a librarian and the way that my community members, the way my patrons were interacting with that story. They really were paying attention to it and they were thinking about their own personal lives. You know, the NSA is sort of this big abstract adversary, but 
what we also learned from Snowden is not just about NSA level stuff. We learned about local police. We learned about Google. We learned about all these ways that um, the systems of surveillance are really rhythmatic. You know, they're all connected to each other. And so, um, yeah, so what, you know, when I got started, I think uh, a lot of people in the hacker world and privacy advocacy world and just in the kind of like civil liberty space took notice of what I was doing because it's an idea that really makes sense. You have these folks who are public servants, you know, library workers who really engage with members of our community in a totally different way than than most other areas of society, right? Like librarians are really welcoming and friendly for the most part, right? We're, we want people to be in our buildings. We want to help them. And people are there mostly to learn how to do things. And technology is a really big part of it. And we have this ethic of privacy. And so um, people people saw that it was a good idea. And yeah, some of them some of them gave us endorsements. Shout out to Ed. Hope you're doing good in Russia with your baby. Um, and your project, it has these crash courses, right? Mm -hmm. Where you guys are, are, are y'all teaching online or is this something where you'll go and show up in person? So this is just online because, you know, obviously we live in hell and we don't get to we're, it's going to be some time before we can do conferences and things like that again. Um, but essentially what the crash courses are, they're training programs for library workers who want to learn about these skills together in a group. Something that we really believe in at Library Freedom Project is collective power. And so our community, what the way that we've developed this community of practice, which is about, it's a little more than a hundred librarians around the U.S. and a couple in Canada and one in Mexico. We, these are all people who've done different LFP training programs, and so the crash courses are are one of those. It's a shorter version. It's a totally online version. But the idea is, get a group, and it's about you know thirty participants or so, and they're from libraries all over the country and different experiences. You know, some of them are. A lot of public libraries, but also academic libraries, folks in big cities, in rural areas, in the South, in the Pacific Northwest, and they all bring their own context and what their community members are concerned about, what's happening with them locally. Um, and, you know, local politics really inform a great deal of this. I mean, you know, thinking about um, like last year, for example, um, folks who were in cities where um, there was a lot of BLM uprising activity happening. There was also a lot of police surveillance happening in those places. And so um, that was a particular concern and need in communities like Minneapolis. Um, obviously, now I can't think of other ones where this was significant, but you know, you get the idea, right? So everybody brings their own context. And then we learn together. And then after these training programs, the folks who have participated in them can do a few different things. The first most obvious thing is they can bring what they've learned back to their library communities. And so they can teach classes to their patrons about privacy. They can teach, they can do trainings for their fellow staff. A lot of them do conference talks. Obviously it's online now. Um, they become kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, they become like privacy thought leaders. In their, in their library and in their region. Um, and if they're really super into the project and they wanna keep going with it, then they're invited to become part of this ongoing community of practice with these dozens of other library workers that are part of LFP. And then they can continue collaborating together. They work on all different kinds of projects. They ask each other questions, they give each other support and advice. And, you know, we are, you know, building that community all the time and, and inviting more people into it and strengthening our relationships with each other and doing really big things to protect privacy in our community. That is wonderful. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge proponent of community networks and people have asked, you know, well, what about doing it on a professional level for those that are asking this, this is how it's done. Just so you know. <laughs> um, so, 
back to the original topics and what brought all of this up. And just so everybody knows, um, when the photos came in, I just reached out over Twitter. This really wasn't planned to uh, mesh as well as it is. Um, so when it comes to censorship, um, well, we've talked about how weeding isn't that, but what do people need to look out for? Well, you know, I think that when I think about censorship, I'm thinking about like much bigger issues than just, you know, individual librarians making decisions about what goes on the shelf or not, because we live in an environment right now of such enormous media consolidation. You know, there's six now, I think five really big, powerful publishers, what Penguin Random House bought Simon and Schuster and now who knows what they're called. And, um, you know, there's only a handful of, of others that are as powerful in that space. The same is true in the academic publishing market. And then not to mention that the biggest um, deciders of free speech and censorship are the big tech companies, Facebook, Google, um, Apple, and, you know, they're different subsidiaries, YouTube, Instagram, et cetera. And so I'm, I'm concerned about censorship, but I'm concerned more about the way that the acceptable, the, the, you know, the sort of the narrowing of a acceptable opinion. And it, it all comes from these very consolidated companies that are beholden to their shareholders only. And so, you know, what does that mean for like what, what gets published or not? Well, one big thing that I see a lot is like how much um, really right wing, sensational, often hateful media is getting published. I think in particular about now I can't think of the name of the book, but that Abigail Schreier book that's like the transgender craze that's killing your daughters or something. And this is a book that's like full of plagiarism and total um like conjecture and like bad research and all this, but because it is so sensational that, and it, you know, it's making money for these big publishers, that's the kind of thing that gets published. So I realize I'm like off on a little bit of a tangent to your original question, but you know, the, those are the issues that I'm really worried about um, because it is, it means that like, you know, what actually makes its way to us in the library um, is not a diversity of opinion at all. You know, it's like the same, the, 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 the New York Times bestseller list that's like five different books by James Patterson and then like, you know, a bunch of nonfiction from these right-wing pundits and like not a whole lot else. <laughs> right. And the thing is with the market the way it is, it, even those who want to push more let's just say divergent viewpoints, they end up self-censoring so they can stay marketable so they can at least get some of that idea out. Right. Um, so you, your main concern seems to be more of a, a, of a diluting of a wide, a wide set of viewpoints that, that eventually find their way to your library. So it's not really this conspiratorial thing. It's just capitalism doing what capitalism does and trying to find the the most marketable thing. Yeah, you know, actually, it's exactly that. And, and you know, Noam Chomsky wrote about this um, like 30 years ago. I forget which book it's in. I think it's in Manufacturing Consent, um, but it's an essay called Propaganda Model. And he talks about all these different filters that exist like to kind of define the acceptable range of like public opinion. And so one of them is big business, which is what we're talking about. But then there's also advertising, you know, advertisers make a lot of the decisions about what is acceptable to publish or acceptable speech because they're the ones who are paying the bill. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a bunch of different forces um, under capitalism. And I really blame a lot of that for you know, the proliferation of, of misinfo, you know, because people rightly start to distrust like 
you know, big tech and big media and all these companies. Um, and then they go looking for alternative sources and those alternative sources are not credible, but they seem like an alternative. They seem like something different. They seem like non-mainstream. Um, and I, I understand people's, um, you know, I, I understand the desire to find things like that. Yeah, no, it definitely makes sense. I, th I think, I think most people at some point go through that phase where they're like, there has to be something else out there. And then the next thing, you know, they're reading something and it probably isn't the best thing for them. Um, and it's probably not accurate information. So I'm, I'm just going to throw this out there. What do you want to say? Because th this conversation was far more, uh, far more, far more interesting than I actually expected to to be. <laughs> um, I love to um, explode the the boring librarian stereotypes, so um, I'm happy to have done that. Well, what I want to say is a few things. So I think um, you know, since we came to be talking about this, because we were talking about the the whole like books in a dumpster debacle. I think the reason that happened is a couple of things. One, people love to be outraged on the internet and like, let's just give them that, right? That person who posted that thing, pro it probably made their whole day to be angry about that. And I, you know, I wish them peace and love. Um, but the other thing is that people really don't understand how libraries work. And so I wanted to say a few things about our value and why people should um, visit their library and why they should protect us. Um, we are one of the only things in society that are in, in American society that are 100% free and not means tested. And for folks who don't know what I mean by that, what I when I say means tested, it means it's not just for poor people, it's for everybody. When social services are means tested and they're just for the poor, that means they're gonna end up being really shitty because our society doesn't care about poor people. And so if things are just for poor people, they end up like crappy or like underfunded or whatever. Libraries being for everyone, everyone who lives in a community pays into it in some form with their taxes and everyone gets to benefit. Now, unfortunately, we, we still manage to live in a society where that kind of thing is really, really undervalued. And you couple that with the fact that all social programs, all social services in the U.S. have been systematically defunded for the last 30 or 40 years. So where have those responsibilities gone as like social workers don't exist as much anymore um, as like, you know, um, the USPS is less and less funded, like all these things. It means that libraries have assumed the burden of a lot of that lack. And so Lots of people end up using the library who need some other form of care or like something else, right? Which is the reason why homeless people end up camping out in the library all day because there isn't anywhere else for them to go. So I say all this to say that libraries need to be significantly better funded. And if we have better funding, we can do a lot more of the amazing work that we do now providing technology help to people, doing English language learning, doing children's story times and other children's programming, doing all kinds of fun stuff for people of all ages and offering really great high quality collections of books that you want to read and you want to check out for free and then return and not have to pay anything because libraries are amazing. So I just invite people to check out their local library and actually support it and recognize like what a, what a valuable thing it is in society. Um, and yeah, I think that is what I wanted to say. Wonderful. Okay. Plug your stuff. Tell them where they can find you and your project. Sure. We are library freedom project. Um, we are on the web at libraryfreedom.org. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter at Library Freedom. You can also follow me on Twitter at Flex Libris, and I tweet about the project a lot. Um, and actually, very soon, I'm going to be redesigning our website a little bit for a better directory of our members. So if you are looking for privacy training or you want to learn about our privacy advocacy work or anything like that, 
we have people in every part of the U.S. And so you can get in touch with us and talk to one of those people and have them help you directly. Um, but in the meantime, yeah, check out our website. and You can get in touch with us there. All right. Sounds good. OK, everybody. So that's going to be the show for today. Um, y'all uh, y'all have a good day and go check out your local library.